Hello and welcome to the Leadership and Construction Podcast. I'm your host, Michael. And today we have a slightly different type of episode. We're still going to touch on the leadership topic, but today we're going to talk more about sort of dyslexia. Um, it's another sort of passion of mine because uh, I, I myself am dyslexic. Um, and to um, sort of join me today in the discussions around the topic is uh, uh, a sort of good friend of mine, a guy called Lawrence Chung. So Lawrence, how's it going? Oh yeah, you're very good. How are you? Yes, I'm great. So I want to thank you for joining me today um, because uh, I know that you're sort of a big advocate in sort of your area uh, of construction for, for people with dyslexia. Um, and it's really sort of important to me that um, we help encourage um, sort of younger people into the construction industry, but also acknowledge that people with dyslexia have some great skill sets that is so applicable to the construction industry that I think is on the sort of site overlooked a lot of the time. Um, and there's a lot of negative press around dyslexia, around sort of the weaknesses that come with dyslexia. And there's never any talk, certainly when I was growing up, about the strengths that we have. So I thought this would be a really great opportunity for you and I to sort of have a chat and share our insights about dyslexia, our, you know, how has it helped us within our career, um, and hopefully try and give other people out there some advice around uh, dyslexia, either for the child or for people just getting into the construction industry or even just into the workplace who have dyslexia. So I want to start off by sort of just asking you about how you got into construction and, and sort of what led you to uh, where you are today. I should probably start off by sort of saying that you're a senior sponsor at Network Rail, is that correct? Yeah. That's right, yeah. Brilliant. Right, well, I'll hand it over to you then to give us a bit of a background. So, I mean, I had your, I had your typical upbringing, dare I say, you know, in Lincolnshire where I grew up, where we said at 11 plus. So um, I was... I'll probably say politely, drill from a very early age, you know, to be very academically driven um, by my parents who were immigrants from Hong Kong. So, so yeah, I, you know, we had, I don't know if you remember, but we used to have, um, um, I think it was exams back in those days. I think we had, the, we had 11 plus, which was the first exam. And then I think it was year nine SATs. I think it might have been, and then GCSEs, and A levels, so back to them plus. So yeah, I, you know, I was drawn from early age to, to, to get to the grammar school in the town. So I you know, passed eleven plus, went to grammar school, and then you know, as we approached or as I approached um, A levels, you know, it was I started having those conversations with my parents, and you probably did the same at school as well with the careers advisor about what you were going to do at university. You know, because at grammar school you were. Traditionally, you went to, you did GCSEs, you went to A levels, you went to university. You know, we didn't really know of any other um, avenues for learning, for, mm. you know, development. It was just, the, it was a traditional method there, I'd call it. So, you know, I had a, a choice, you know, what did I do? I did, I, at A level, I think I did maths, physics, chemistry, and then the outlier, which was sociology. <laughs> um, there I say it. Uh, because that gave me the the wider pick of subjects to do university, and yeah. then as I was growing up, I um, I loved the practical stuff, I loved building stuff, the touching stuff. You know, typical, typical. Dare I say, it, boy, growing up, you know, I was given Lego and stuff like that. You know, yeah. I just love building stuff, and it just lends oh, itself. That sort of thing. Yeah, just lends itself towards towards building and then you look around and you think oh what could I do and then one of my neighbours um, was an engineer not a civil engineer what I ended up doing um, but a chemical engineer and and he was like you know engineering is somewhere you should probably look towards so I was like, oh you know engineering and start looking into it and at school I had a really 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 um, good physics teacher he won't remember he won't remember me but I remember him <laughs> And he was someone that came from industry, from what I remember, to teaching. And you can tell those sort of people that come from industry to teaching. And they have such a, a different way of, of teaching things. It was incredible. It was incredible. Anyway, ended up um, studying um, civil engineering at Loughborough University. 
where I discovered sports more than engineering. <laughs> but obviously, as you all know, with engineering, it's a it's a proper, proper intensive degree. Um, nine to five, Monday to Friday, apart from Wednesday afternoons, obviously, which was sports. Um, for three, I did I did three years. Um, at the end of my first year, I applied to some um, some local engineering firms. Uh, I managed to get a summer placement at well, the one that I, I met you at in yeah. Newark. Yeah. Berk Screen, it was called. Yeah. I think it's been taken over now, obviously. Mm -hmm. My RPS, a far larger company. Yeah. Uh, but yes, um, I did that. Um, I was really lucky that they offered me a, um, a full-time job after, after university. And they also offered some money towards university as well, which is brilliant. So I didn't, I didn't do the industry, which is a lot of what a lot of engineering students do these days. Yeah. And I graduated and I graduated straight into the recession, 2007, 2008 it was. Yeah. But I was lucky enough to have a job and I was really grateful for that. And that's when you joined RPS? Or... That's when I joined RPS. Yeah, that's exactly yeah. the same time I joined actually, yeah. But I didn't come from graduate, I came from apprentice route. So I was straight out of like secondary school. So we joined at the same time. Yeah, yeah. So, so you went the apprenticeship route. Yeah, yeah. What did you did you join at the end of year eleven? Is that no? So it's after A levels. So I oh, okay. joined at um, I think it was seventeen. It was such a long time ago. It was two thousand seven. So I'm going to go with seventeen, eighteen years old. And then you, and you started an apprentice. So you started was a drafts person. Yeah, exactly that. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. I've been That's I've been amazing. working I've been working in it now for fourteen years, <laughs> same as you, but straight straight out of school. <laughs> and that's the thing I don't really I don't know anything else but engineering. Obviously, mm. I did the odd jobs. Obviously, when I was growing up, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And the, the family had a Chinese take a Chinese restaurant, which helped out. But you know, in terms of my formal career, I've only ever known construction and engineering. Mm. Mm. Um, what was it attracted yeah, you then, about the uh, civil engineering degree? I would say Loughborough and engineering. One was it was a really practical course. Mm -hmm. It was really diverse in its um, curriculum modulus, I think it's called. Yeah. You know, you had, it wasn't just structural mechanics, one, two, three, four. You know, maths one, two, three, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There was loads of stuff. There was surveying. Yeah. There was stuff in the lab. There was construction management. I think we shared our cohort, our our school, with the construction managers. You know, yeah. who are traditionally we'll call it the ones actually on site. Mm. So you had a really good interaction with those. You know, we would. It was just a more well-rounded. Mm engineering degree than probably that was some of those offered at different schools different universities mm. which were very very academic driven very very um well as you well know when you do a degree um you can really tell where those sort of people are going to end up and a lot of my um fellow uh, cohort um, from Loughborough university actually went to the contractors yeah yeah, I don't. I don't think there were that many with the consultancy, which is obviously where I met you in the yeah. engineering consultancy. So yeah, it was a. It was really the the, the well the more well rounded, um, degree. That yeah. offered, and also it actually it, it gave us it gave you the choice between the three year, a four year, or a five year, and I wanted that choice as well. Mm -hmm. So once you got into uh, industry, then at RPS the screen, where did it go from there? So it's being open, and I hope, and I, and I hope some people from our person listen to this. <laughs> I wasn't the most technical of engineers, you know. I had my strengths and my weaknesses, and technical engineering is probably not one of my not one of my strengths. Um, I was never someone you could just put into a corner, go and design this, and I go away and do it. You know, yeah, was which, never one of my strong points. Which team were you put into? Um, was it primarily structural engineering that you were doing buildings or was it all the sort of pavements and drainage and things like that called with civil engineering? It was a train care facilities team. Mm. So it was uh, railway. So it was depots, 
there was a handful of stations. It was stuff like that. Uh, and luckily, um, my mentor, I, I call him a mentor, but you know, my first line, very, very first line manager, he also um, was, I think he did some, I think what's traditional is a client rep role for, um, for Ikea, I think it was, if I can say Ikea. And so we used to carry out that function as well, looking at people's works, you know, a contractor's works to make sure it was delivered uh, to spec, to time, to quality, et cetera, et cetera. And that's the stuff I really enjoyed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Going out to site and seeing stuff and, and, and seeing how stuff is made, et cetera, et cetera. That was stuff I really enjoyed. So yeah, um, I had a really good experience in the first couple of years I had there. You know, I really knew what I was, what I wanted to do, what I enjoyed, what I was good at, what I wasn't good at. Mm. Uh, and actually, it was it was my as line manager, it was my mentor that actually told me, you know, I don't. He, even he said himself, technical engineering is 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 not where you're going to end up. It's not where you'll be. Mm -hmm. I see you more as going to the projects part of the of the construction industry, mm -hmm. which was completely new to me. I didn't know anything about that. Mm -hmm. So I listened to that advice. Um, I did two years and I thought, you know what? Um, I think I want to do some further learning. I think I want to do a master's. And so I started looking at master's that were of a slightly non-technical um, background. Uh, and I ended up studying at the University of Manchester, um, management of projects. One, because it was an accredited, I think it's JBM um, course that allowed me to get chartered in, uh, as a child engineer and two it was a new city etc etc i think fantastic things to learn uh, and three it was a really 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 um again i looked at the course modulus and i was like you know these are things that i don't know anything about amazing i'm going to go there and learn about that so that's what i ended up doing i did a, a year in manchester uh do management projects you know again meeting new people it's fantastic amazing best experience of my life I, I now live in manchester you know i, st I stayed here so yeah, that was a great experience. Um, learning about the project side of stuff. So it was half, um, I call it um, the technical stuff of project management, you know, Gantt charts. Yeah. Um, contract administration, uh, finance, uh, project finance, that sort of stuff. But also a lot of the course, half the course was dedicated towards the soft part of, of, of projects. Yeah. What I now see is the, the strengths that dyslexia can give. Mm -hmm. So there's all the stuff around leadership, around motivation, around negotiation, about people and organizations, about conflict management, mm -hmm. you know, all that sort of stuff that I never knew any about that sort of stuff. And that was the really interested me. It was weird. It really interested me. It was like, because <laughs> I had already studied, uh, sorry, because I already, we'll call it practiced for two years within the industry. When it came to learning all that theory, you could directly apply it. It was incredible. It's probably the mm. same as you, you know, in your, in your um, distance learning or learning on the job. Mm. I think it's an accelerator of learning because you can, I felt that you, you can actually directly apply what you were learning yeah. to that. I couldn't agree more. I don't want to deviate too much, but just to sort of pick up on that. Um, I was horrendous at school from day one. So when I started the school education system at age four, right up until when I left and joined RPS at age 17. Um, it was horrendous. It was a horrendous time for me. The minute I started RPS um, and the company is kind of, um, you know, not really a catalyst to this, but the, a company that would support you through doing day release uh, education. Um, and then that, as you said, that education was directly relatable to the work I was doing on the day job every single day. So there was that connect. I could almost see, relate to what I was learning in the classroom to what I was doing as a, as a day job. So when we started mm -hmm. getting sieves out and started to look at soils and different aggregate sizes, and we'll start and apply that to the soils and the uh, pavement that we we're building, you know, whatever airport we we're working at the time. So I, I, could, I could make that connection then. Um, I was just hopeless in a classroom where there was just read learn by textbook type stuff which is what i was i was taught from four to 17 you know so so yeah exactly as you say that's when i started to really my education started to really go places i couldn't i didn't think it would go and and 
you know, I just want to highlight the point there is that you've gone through a degree, traditional sort of course of going through uh, school education, university degree, and then going again to doing a master's. Was a master's full time, was it? Yeah, full time, yeah. 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 And, and you know, I, I may have done mine part time, but as, as like you, I've gone through HNC, HND degree and, and then professionally qualified, you know. And for me, I just want to, that is something I never thought I'd be able to attain. In fact, many people told me I would never be able to attain that, never be an engineer. I was always told that would never happen. You settle for being a car mechanic, which there's nothing wrong with that, but I've got bigger aspirations than, than that. So, so yeah. when did you get diagnosed with dyslexia then? So I was diagnosed at six. So wow. Okay. Yeah, that's quite a young, quite a young age, really. I was quite fortunate. Really young. To yeah. be fair. What about yourself? I was diagnosed at university. Wow. So I was diagnosed after my first year. I it was in my second year. I was really struggling. Mm-hmm. You know, and I, th- I think people who listen to this with dyslexia will identify with this. The coursework I was smashing out of the park. It was fine. Mm-hmm. It was the exams that I was really suffering, bringing the grade right down. Really? And I think someone said, um, I think you should go and see the educational psychologist and get a dyslexia test. And I thought, you know, it's a brilliant facility to have. I'll, I'll go and have a look. I'll go and do it. Uh, and I did the test. And they said... And then I came back for the results and then went, but well, we've got some good news and bad news. <laughs> and I was like, this sounds, sounds promising. It sounds promising. It's amazing. What's this going to be? The good news is that you've got a, an IQ of 147. And I was like, amazing. What's the bad news? <laughs> I went, you can't use all of that because you're dyslexic. <laughs> so, so I was like, well, how do you mean? And they went, uh, uh, and do you remember your dyslexia test? I remember bits of the first one. I've had two actually. I had one at six, oh, yeah. and then I had another one just before I went to uni to basically confirm <laughs> I still had it, and and I would get all the support I needed at university. But yeah, very much like Brilliant. yourself, is that people with dyslexia tend to have quite a high IQ or above average IQ, but then there are certain parts which they just find. Tricky, trickier than sort of um, your average person, like your spelling yeah, and your so, reading. Yeah, so th- th- they did the test and it was like the verbal, non verbal, and stuff. And they said, basically, said your base IQ is, you know, about 147, but there are certain elements of the test that we've done that show that actually they're not equal to 147. And that's how they, the, it's the difference that they said was what constituted a. A, a diagnosis of dyslexia. I was like, okay, fine. I'm not, I don't know what dyslexia is, but okay, no worries. Just tell me what I need to do, how I can help it, et cetera, et cetera. And the first thing they said was, well, if you don't know what dyslexia is, um, for you, dyslexia is, imagine a computer. You've got the best top of the range, motherboard, et cetera, et cetera. The box is amazing. But your camera, your screen, your mouse, your keyboard, your printer are all like 10 years old. So it'll take a long time getting to the computer or process it really quickly. And it'll take a long time coming out. That is you. And I was like, how do you mean? And I went, well, when I ask you to write something quickly, physically, you dot the I's and cross the T's like on the second letter or over the first, the, you know, the second letter, not over the actual letter. So physical, that's a physical manifestation of your dyslexia. You're already thinking about the next thing before you're even completing the thing that I hand. And I was like, oh, wow. That was a be- For me, that, that was completely, you know, that was crazy what, what they were saying, telling to me. And they went, basically, yeah, for you, you've got a really shockingly bad short-term memory. Um. And that's a you know that's one of the biggest things around dyslexia. Yeah, that's a classic trait. It's the probably the trait that my wife hates the most. So she'll tell me yeah. to go and grab something or two things from upstairs, and I'll go and get one of them. <laughs> she'll be like, "Where's where's 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 the other thing? 
It's better to go upstairs and forget what you're upstairs for. <laughs> I'm upstairs. Yeah. yeah. Or or so, send me to the shop to get something and then I have to call her. What did you want again? I completely forgot. Yeah. It's cool. And one of the things I bet that you manage to get around that is you make lists. Yeah. I, I make uh, lists. Send it into me a text message. What do you want? Send you me a text message now. Otherwise, I'm going to forget it. It's going to happen. Yeah. I'm going to forget. So I make lists that like that is. And we talk about, I mean, I probably talk about it now, but, you know, we've identified dyslexia. We've identified, you know, um, what your type of dyslexia is, if you want to call it that. And then obviously they were like, right, okay, now we need to teach you or show you methods to cope mm. with your, what they call disability. And what I don't like being called disability. No. I call it difference. Yeah. yeah. It's a difference. And yeah. dare I say it, a gift. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, to use your computer analogy, I like to sort of say people without dyslexia are working on um, Microsoft Windows, some even Windows XP. Um, but uh, dyslexia is, uh, is your Macintosh. You know, it's they both do roughly the same thing and they just do it in different styles and different ways. Um, and exactly. I think dyslex people with dyslexia have all that great potential. It's just done in a slightly different, different way to, to people that yeah. haven't got dyslexia. So. just different way of thinking different way of, absolutely exactly what you just said there yeah 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 i mean i think um that that's amazing sort of story um uh, and i just want to sort of add to it really because i mentioned there that um i was diagnosed at six so i think this is where i was sort of really fortunate in that and, and, and now being a father of a five-year-old i can sort of see what my parents were going through at the time so i'd gone and started school at age four and um, I wasn't ever meeting any of the milestones that traditional education or the curriculum was expecting me to hit. And in hindsight, that's not a surprise because the way the education system is set up isn't to tailor for people with dyslexia, you know. Um, so I wasn't able to write my name. I wasn't able to do ABC. I wasn't able to sequ sequence things and organize things and stuff like that. And um, my mum tells me that, you know, she went into, a, into the school to have a meeting with the teacher um, because I was just so far behind. Uh, and and you know, this is early 90s, so dyslexia wasn't talked about a lot, really. And um, the, the school didn't help. The school just said to my mum, you're not going to like this, but he's just lazy, just lazy, doesn't want to do the work. And my mum was completely not accepting that. So she wouldn't really know where to turn, but she was told to go and speak to a child psychologist who then decided maybe I should go and get tested for dyslexia. And then like you, she's like, well, I haven't got a clue what dyslexia is. And uh, she read up on it. And as she was reading up on the sort of traits of someone with dyslexia, she was like reading about me. She was reading about her son, like, Jesus, that's Michael. Like I could be reading <laughs> a book about what Michael is. And so I went and got tested and no, by no surprise, I was diagnosed with dyslexia. So she took all that diagnosis back to the school and said, look, he, he's not lazy. He's just, he's got dyslexia, which means he needs a bit more support in other areas. Uh, and the school just did not accept that. They didn't want to give me more support. And um, so my mum, I think over a couple of years, then decided to pull me out and my sister out of that school and take me to a different school where they had a learning support department that would cater for the school so I would that first school was a big school there's quite a lot of children and it comes from all different areas so I was just a sort of you know a small fish in a massive pond went to this other school which had this sort of support but it was in the middle of the countryside and it was a tiny school and I was about the only person going to this learning support so already I'm sort of getting singled out and sort of thinking oh why am I getting singled out and the and the differences started to get a bit more highlighted it's like, okay okay this isn't this isn't right but I got a lot of support there that I mean I wasn't able to write name and days of the week and numbers and this is like 10 years old you know um until I started that and they really helped me through that um and then that really geared me up for going to secondary school and then when I went to secondary school this is I was living at Cumbria at this time so I wasn't even from Nottinghamshire originally so then at, wow. when I moved, when I went to secondary school, I had to not only go into the big school, but I had to go to the big school in a different county, different part of the country that spoke with a different accent <laughs> and, um, you know, meet a whole lot of new people. 
Um, at the same time, I had to go and they didn't call it learning support, they called it special needs. Um, and you know, you're, you're approaching teenage years, you're not going to go to something that's called special needs. Um, so I didn't get the support I needed at school. I mean, I got extra time on my exams uh, and I did okay in my exams. I'm not an A-star student. Um, lots of people with dyslexia are, but I just, I wasn't. I think I just um, wasn't, I don't want to blame people I wasn't getting the support, but I wasn't, but I also wasn't applying myself. I just thought if no one else cared, then why should I? Um, and then I went to A-levels because I figured that's gonna be the next thing. What do I do? And um, I didn't really have a clue to be honest, but the subject, and I wasn't good in any particular subjects, but I just said to my tutor at the time, I, I, there's two subjects which I like, which was technology and physics. So you mentioned physics. And I think the reason why I like those, as you say, the teachers had a background from industry and I liked the technology side of things, because like you, all my life playing with Lego, Lego, playing with Meccano, things like this, sketching and drawing, imagining things, you know, imagining how to build robots and trying to put our bits of wood together to build up like a whatever. And um, I was able to do that then at school. I thought that's brilliant. <laughs> I, can, I can almost like slack off school a little bit and just focus on doing the things I enjoy doing. Um, the, the teachers at the time didn't want me to go and do those subjects because I wasn't great at those subjects. And certainly physics, they wanted the A-star students to go into that. Um, but I did them anyway. And I didn't come up with the best grades, but I enjoyed doing it. Um, and, you know, I sort of fed up with education at this point, which is why I didn't really want to go to uni full time. Um, and to be honest, I didn't get a lot of support. So I was looking at going to uni but going to do uni as like a car mechanic not the i was looking at courses at university at loughborough for automotive engineering and all these like you know aerospace engineering and, and, and i don't think i even looked i'd even heard of never heard of civil engineering at this point um but we were you know i was looking at you know basically i can't do aeronautical or automotive i have to go and do mechanical and and basically put put cars back together uh so i wasn't really uh, excited by that proposition and which is when um, again my mum found ad in the paper for Bert's Green and this is how old this is you know, and ad in the paper you don't get that much more in LinkedIn but I had an ad in the paper um, to be a, a trainee's brass person that would then put you through your training I thought well, that sounds good so I went and did that um, and when I went for the interview I was sort of thinking oh I won't be an architect because this is that's because you've got two avenues at Bert's Green architect or yeah. engineering and I figured, okay, I quite like architecture because I quite like art. So I did art at A level and at GCSEs and stuff. So art and physics, who the fuck does that? Anyway, so I did, I was quite into art. So I thought I'd do architecture. And, and you'll remember the director, Jonathan Green, I'm sure. He was sort of my mentor throughout my whole career. And I remember meeting him the first time in the interview. And I sort of said to him, I wanted to do architecture. And he was just looking down at my CV, looked up at me and said, no, you'll do engineering. And they went back to the interview. And I don't argue with him. I was 17. This is, you know, the head of the company at the time. I'm not going to argue with you. If you tell me I'm doing engineering, that's what I'm doing. Uh, and I don't know if he saw something or if he, you know, had some idea of what he wanted. But I've, I've been in that ever since. I love it. And I'm not, I don't want to sound big headed about it. But because I love it, because I have a passion for engineering, I've gotten rather good at it, you know. And very much like you, I'm not into the detail and the technical stuff. I do like that and I have been forced to get into that at stages, but I'm very much the front end concept, high level thinking, imagining what could this look like type design, skipping out the detail. And then when it gets to site, I start getting more interested again, you know, about the contract administration, the program, the dealing with problems as you find them in the ground. You know, you can design anything to detail, but you can never account for the things you don't know about. And that's the problems when you get into engineering, you've got to think on your feet, you've got to use your imagination, you've got to come up with different solutions on the spot, you can't, you know, you're not sat around a whole load of standards, the standards mean nothing when you've got a hole in the ground, you've got to fill it up with concrete or something. So, I, 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 you must have seen something in me or, or whatever, I don't know, but that turned out to be the best route for me. And as I say, since then, you know, it's played to all my strengths, I've um gone through HNC, HND, done my degree, professional qualification. Um, and each time I'm sort of moving 
like yourself, really away from the detail design aspect to it and more towards the project management side of it and the people's side of it. And, and now I'm sort of starting to find new passions because I love contract administration. I love, um, which is really bizarre, but I, I, I can sort of see the broader picture of a contract mm. and see how things interconnect. And um, as long as we don't get lawyers involved, it's okay. Um, but, um, but yeah, sort of very much like yourself, really. Uh, now, back in the school days, it, we had sort of slightly different paths, but now we're sort of getting to more sort of similar paths, which I don't think is um, accidental. I think that sort of plays to the traits or the strengths of people with dyslexia more than, uh, than people without dyslexia. Uh, yeah, I think so. No doubt you would have succeeded being an architect, to be honest with you. No doubt. You know, but it's true we always end up in the paths that we take are always convoluted you know there can be my path you know the fact that I'm, a, I'm a senior sponsor if you told me it when i was just soliciting engineering at loughborough you know one day you, you know when you're 30 something you will be at network rail as a senior sponsor i'd be like i don't even know what network rail is or what senior sponsor is mm. So it is, you are right. And you always fall into your, your strengths. It's the strengths that I want to concentrate on. Mm. It's the strengths that people, that you always obviously, people recognise the strengths and you always play to your strengths. Mm. Absolutely. And what I say to, because um, I'm a coach and a mentor, uh, you know, in the organisation, what I say to, to, to a lot of people, my belief is that, your strengths will always remain your strengths. And we need to build on your strengths so they can further enhance them. With the, with the weaknesses part, we'll build them up to a point where they're not recognisable as weaknesses, but they will never be strengths. Your strengths are the ones that will get you through, will make you succeed, et cetera, et cetera. And that's one of the biggest things around dys dyslexia, I feel, is we'll get to a stage where, you know, you look at the weaknesses um, that dyslexia may, 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 the symptoms of dyslexia may, may show. That we just spoke about lists and stuff, short term memory. But the strengths part massively outweigh all of that, hugely outweigh all of that. You know, uh, what, what did you say? Big picture. Mm -hmm. You know, the fact that we can see the bigger picture. Outside, I had a discussion. outside the box thinking, you know, all that. Outside kind of... the box, you know, so many times. My team have told me, you've leapt, you've, you've, you're like four steps ahead or sideways or wherever. Like, why are you talking about this when we're talking about this? I'm like, oh, yeah, sorry. Let me just backtrack and let me tell you how I've got there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've said a comment completely at random. And I do that all the time. It's one of my, <laughs> the, the team understand that now. And I actually had the same conversation with someone in the department. Uh, earlier this week that we'll talk about someone else and I was like yeah that person's got dyslexia and they're like how do you mean and I was like they're a great lateral thinker and they're always two or three steps ahead of I recognize that trait in that person with me you know because you think they're often wild tangent but no it's actually amazing because what they've done is they've, they've thought out of the out of the box and they're actually saying this is a potential issue potential problem we should also think about this and then obviously some people are like, you know, whatever. But we, you know, more often than not, that occurs. So we should, you know, I think it's a great, great, great asset. Yeah, I, th I think I think you're right. And I just want to um, emphasize that a little bit as well, because uh, in the construction sector, um, historically, we've always faced lots of different challenges, whether it be a technical challenge or whether it be a process challenge or whatever. And to be, I don't like to use the word innovative, but to solve problems, uh, it requires thinking in a different way that we always, we haven't always thought. So, you know, if we look at the kind of challenges that we're facing today, things like uh, net zero carbon, um, scarcity of water resources, um, all these sort of big subjects um, within society that civil engineers but the construction and industry as well have a massive role to play. People with those strengths of, of um, dyslexia and, and being able to um, think in different ways, to look at problems from different angles, from different um, ways, um, will help to solve these great big problems.
problems that we are facing in society. And I, I, and certainly, um, this is no disrespect from the company I work for or companies I've worked for, um, but organisations aren't set up, or very few organisations aren't set up to, to um, bring out those great qualities in individuals. So that's something that's been my experience. And um, we can sort of almost say, it, you know, if you're going to be a civil engineer, you're going to be a structural engineer, just to pick on those two items, you've got to focus in on, that's how you're going to do it. You know, that's how you do it. But quite a lot of times when I've looked at an engineering problem, sometimes the answer hasn't been to build more assets or, you know, to, to build a new bridge or to put some more pavement in. Sometimes it's actually just been to change a process or to change how maybe the client uses that piece of infrastructure um, and, it, and it's that outside of boxing thinking that I'm, I'm sort of talking about um, which I oh know we don't do that we're civil engineers we don't talk about that sort of stuff but it doesn't matter if I'm a civil engineer or an engineer or an architect or whatever that's a solution that doesn't mean we have to build an asset you know and one of the best things to help net carbon zero is to not build assets which goes against <laughs> my career because if I if I don't if people stop building assets I won't be needed as a civil engineer anymore. But well, there are other ways um, to 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 grow businesses, to grow the railway system, for example, that doesn't involve having to build more railway. You know, what do you reckon? And you're dead right. My so it's funny you say that. So my current role is all about benefits. So what is the benefit? What do we want to achieve and how do we get there? There are many, many ways to get to that benefit, you know, and obviously my, my one of my big responsibilities in, in my job is to, is to be accountable for the, for the projects that I, that are in my portfolio. And don't get me wrong. I'd love to, to be responsible or to be accountable for a five billion pound project. Amazing. But is it the right thing to do more often than not? No, there's always a solution that's going to be cheaper, harder to get to. So it's not just an infrastructure solution. It might be a, a rolling stock solution or a timetabling solution, you know, um, or a blend of all of them. And, you know, it's about trying to understand what we want at the end and how we're going to get there. But not losing sight of that, you know, yeah, we, we use the term value engineering, don't we, in the construction industry. What does value engineering, in, engineering mean? It means not delivering something. It means cutting scope. Yeah, exactly. Or, yeah, or does it actually mean finding a, a different way of doing something that is cheaper? Or it doesn't actually add any value doing this. So why are we doing it? Mm. Is it because of what we call preferential engineer, engineering within 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 construction or is it just because you know it's the right thing to do at this time no it's we mustn't lose sight of the of the bigger picture and i think i think what you said there is absolutely is absolutely right so it's about i think being dyslexic has really helped me or sort of being dyslexic having the strength of dyslexia has really helped me in my current job role absolutely Can you expand on that a little bit more how so Specifically, give me like a, have you got an example maybe? A lot of, what, a lot of project sponsorship is stakeholder management, a lot. And with stakeholder management, you've got negotiation, you've got um, just network in general, you know, just what are dyslexic people usually being good at? They're, we're people, people. Why are we people, people? I've got a, I have a, a theory about this and I think it's what you said before about passion. So I think when you're passionate about something, you really want to understand it. You know, you really want to understand the, the bits, nuts and bolts, et cetera, et cetera. And I think if you think about it, Because we're because we're, we're, we're people, people. Because we, we like understanding um, people, if you want to call it that. I think if you think about it on a flip on its head, I think that's called empathy. 
because you want to empathize with the other person. You want to understand what drives them, what, what they really want from, from you, from, from work, from life, et cetera, et cetera. You really want to identify and understand that person. And I think when you put that into play as a, as, as my current job role, you're really connecting with people in a one-to-one, -one. not this, I know I say this, but yeah, not this fake connection, not this small talk, not this, you know, how are you doing, et cetera, et cetera. You're really trying to identify what they want, what drives them, what, you know, the authenticity in that person. And I think, I don't know if this is the case, I think then they also see the authenticity in you because it's not fake. It's not fake. I really want to know who you are. I really want to get on with you. And I think dyslexic people, they really see um, people, see what they're about. They see, I think, I know it's a, 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 right, a horrible term, but I think they see the essence of, of that person. And so therefore, I think it's, it's really weird, but I think through my time, you know, I've ne I've, this, this natural way of communication, of, 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 of connecting with people, just lends itself to build a big network. And in my current job role as a sponsor, project sponsorship is all about networking. You know, a problem's come up. Shit, who do I call? And I, because you have an extensive network, you are able to call upon that. Because you're making, I call them friends, and I, and I count them as friends, because you have so many friends within, within, within the organization, you can call on them. And they're willing to help you because you're willing to help them. And yeah. no doubt at some point you've helped them. Uh, and so when you call upon them to help you, they're more than, they want to help you. But on that part about connecting with people, I'm, I'm not sure if you've read the book, Getting to Yes. Have you heard about that book before? I've not heard that. It's a negotiation good, book. Yeah, it's really, really good. One of the top 10 books I recommend that people probably read, Getting to Yes, about negotiation. And one of the, the biggest things about that is to negotiate successfully, it's about the problem, not the person. And a lot yeah. of people, they really, 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 really get hung up on the adversarial nature of negotiation with the person. And yeah. I think when you're really trying to connect with someone, that adversarial nature really goes away. Mm -hmm. And then you're focusing on the problem. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what's helped with the negotiation part of, yeah. of my work yeah um, the big part of also is about dyslexia and this is probably a connection with, with with the leadership part of, of what we're discussing is you know what you're not good at i know what i'm not good at mm -hmm. you know i'm not good at detail i'm not good at reading and writing endless reports that i'm just not good at it i'm just <laughs> I, I can do it don't get me wrong it will take me a little bit longer than some people and i need to be locked away in a room with no distractions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I know what I'm not good at. So, as a dyslexic leader, dare I say it, you have to delegate. And with delegation, you have to trust people, and that is probably something that I would say that I'm relatively good at is trusting people. You know, I trust them absolutely that they're doing the right thing that they're making the right decisions once i've delegated that that responsibility that task whatever it is i'll leave you to it call me if you need help i'm happy to lend you let, let, give you my thoughts etc cetera, etc cetera. but here's a big picture here's what we should be doing i'd like you to take this bit and, and get on with it and i'll do this bit and i'll get, get on with it and that's yeah. the delegation part is a, is a huge huge part of, of what i do if uh, I'm not, you know, I do not like to micromanage. I do not, I do, we don't have to have the time for it. No. But actually, dare I say, I, I don't even, it's not even about that. It's about the entrustment and the empowerment of people because, because I'm crap at it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a huge amount of great things you said there. I mean, I think you're absolutely right. Empathy is a, is a, is a dyslexic strength for sure. And uh, it's something that I, I can see in myself as well. So it might not be a surprise to anybody that I've got really big passion about leadership. And as you started reeling off all those things about empathy and connecting with people and, and stuff like that, 
you're describing someone who's got a strong strength in, in, in dyslexia, dyslexia, but also a great leader as well. And so I think, I, I, I believe this, whether I'm right or wrong, but people with dyslexia, and I see it more often than not, tend to be also good leaders. They can empathize with people, they can connect with people. Um, and, um, you know, it's not about having the answers. A lot of the times I don't have any of the answers. Uh, like yourself, you know, you, you, you say you could do a report, you could write the report, but you're not the best at it. Um, and being able to connect with people, being able to empathize and, and, and on, a, on a deeper level helps in order to build that network of people up and, and um, get, the, get the job done, really. And it, it, as you're describing that, it reminds me of a really famous person with dyslexia, which is Sir Richard Branston. You know, he always talks about um, surrounding himself with just brilliant people. And he's the visionary. That is great about dyslexia. He can see the big picture. He can see where we want to go. And he believes in it. And he entrusts people and empowers people to be able to, to do that. Um, and, and then the other people that are with him can focus in on the tasks and to get the, the mini bits and pieces done. But he doesn't come and tell them how to do their job. And these are all just great leadership bits and pieces. This is just the mechanics of leadership. Um, and so, you know, as you say, you're connecting dyslexia with leadership. We are gonna need more and more great leaders and, and the construction industry more, needs more and more great leaders. Um, and the more we wake up to the fact that people with dyslexia have such great strengths in these areas, um, rather than it being a hindrance, you know, because I'm a civil engineer, I've got to write reports, I've got to get spelling correct on drawings and things like that. It's, it's about the strengths that we can bring to the table. And I'll tell you one thing, actually, um, in 2020, I worked on a really great project all the way through the pandemic. We um, all worked from home, didn't meet a single person in the team. The team was massive. They worked in Spain, London, Dublin, all over the world. We, we had employees. Um, and it was, you know, we, quite, the team was made up of the client um, and suppliers and consultants from all different walks of life, architects, structural engineers, civil engineers. And the team that I worked in specifically on a day-to-day -day basis, the civil engineering team for airports, every single member of our team was dyslexic. Just by chance, not by purpose, but every single one of us was diagnosed with dyslexia at some point. And it, uh, to me, it's no surprise that I feel that's some of the best work we've ever done. And, uh, and certainly we all felt inspired about that work. And, um, you know, we were on a daily basis playing to our strengths. You know, we weren't looking at the detail, but we, we knew where we were trying to get to and we were imagining it, we we're forming the picture in our head, using our creativity, because it's concept, we're not getting into the detail of, of things. We were just sketching things out, drawing things out, space planning. We were using our creativity. Um, the bits that we fell down on, which was the report writing stuff like that, we just helped one another out. We just had each other's backs. Yeah. Um, and so we gave ourselves a bit more time. Um, and, you know, I think that I think that was, you know, one of my favourite projects that I worked on. It will probably go down for a long time. It's been my favourite one. And, and, and just by sheer coincidence, it was just every single one of us was just dyslexic. You know? So we were, all of us were absolutely playing to our strengths. So it's the, that was just the power. And, and maybe in the future, that's where if, if, you're, if you're a leader, if you're a, a, a manager of a consultancy, and they're going to be people doing master plans and people doing concept designs and construction elements. Target people with dyslexia in those two areas and your industry is going to thrive. And then the people that really love the detail about sitting on my master series and micro drainage and getting the last millimetre out of a pipe or, you know, making sure the connection details are correct, get them stuck in the middle where they want to focus all that attention. And you've got then a great broad spectrum of people with great talents and playing to their ups, utmost strength and, and, and the organisation will thrive. And this is why, like, and what you said there is, you know, absolutely amazing because you said it was a team of dyslexic people and actually our weaknesses were very similar, you know. So, Mike, I'm a diversity and inclusion champion at work and I believe greatly in diversity in teams because you want that diversity in I call it thinking 
some people call it neuro, some people call it um, cognitive, some people call it culture, whatever. You want that diversity across in your team because it's that diversity that makes the team succeed. You know, you want some dyslexic people in there. You want some non dyslexic people in there. You know, um, I'm sure you know about the Myers-Briggs personality mm. test. You want different personalities also in there because you want people to, what well, we learn of each other. And that's one of the greatest things, I think, that once people have identified, so in that organisational perspective that you said, if you can recognise those traits in people, those strengths and weaknesses, you can play them off against each other. Strengths and weaknesses combined with other people so that unit, that team is hugely strong. You know, I have, I've heard of companies that do these tests before you start at the company. So they place you into teams that are lacking mm-hmm. um, your traits, strengths and weaknesses because they are super high performing teams. And you are right. I think sooner or later, I think we need to embrace embrace that because, because otherwise we're putting, that's the that lovely saying, square pegs into round holes. Mm-hmm. We, we, we need to get away from that situation where, you know, engineers are engineers and architects are architects or whatever it is. No, it's people are people. So we need to understand what they're good at, what they're, what they're passionate. We, they, we may not even, you may not even know your dyslexia. You might not even know your passion. You might not even found it yet. But as dyslexic people, once you've found your passion, once you spark that curiosity in you, you are going to be, you know, the best at what you can do. Because um, you explore, you explore every avenue, you can think the, the, the bigger picture. One thing I've, I've, I've noticed, and I'm not sure if you're the same as a dyslexic person, because I talk to these people, I talk to people all the time. I have some crazy dreams. I have some crazy ass dreams. You know, I'm a dreamer. You know, my girlfriend calls me a dreamer. Because we're always thinking about, we're always thinking different. We're always imagining something else. We're always trying to think, you know, admittedly, I just bring myself back to a conversation sometimes or back to the problem at hand because I'm already thinking two or three steps ahead. But really, you know, yeah. I think that's a great strength. Also yeah. a weakness, but great strength. Yeah, I, 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 I 100% see where you're at with that. And I'm exactly the same. Not in the sense of asleep dreaming, but in that I am perfectly happy in fact if i'm reading a book and i love reading books you know i'm dyslexic and most people with dyslexia do actually love reading you know that's a, you can't just tell someone to to read more books because that'll help no but i love reading books and and i love that books that's i i mean i've got a whole bookshelf behind me of stuff i love to read and but what will happen is i'll start reading and then it'll spark something in my mind and i'll start thinking about that and going off a bit of tangent and, oh really i'm reading a book here <laughs> It takes a lot longer. To, I mean, my wife can read a book in about a couple of days. It takes me months to read a book. I enjoy doing it. Um, but my mind starts running away with it. Like, that's a great, interesting leadership yeah. concept. I'm going to do this stuff phone and start imagining stuff. And then before you know it, it's like when you start watching YouTube and you just keep going and going and watching the next video and the next video. And then before you know it, you're nowhere near where you started. Um, but yeah, that's that's classic dyslexic trait. And it's also a really good strength. It's so, it's so funny you say that, you know, I, 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 I'll, I'll go and research something on Wikipedia or YouTube and then two hours later, I'm, I'm somewhere like, I'm somehow in Bali or something, <laughs> looking at, you know, finding out what the sand in Bali is for some reason, <laughs> because it's literally down a path, which is, you know, which, which I'll probably ask you now then, actually. What, how do you cope with your dyslexia then? You know, what, what sort of mechanisms have you put in place in your life then to, to help you with your weaknesses we'll call it hmm it's a good question um i think throughout my school education i had little things that would help um little rhymes to help remember spelling things and again they were just coping mechanisms um lists as you say that sort of stuff but more on my day-to-day thing i'm maybe not aware of it to be honest I, and nothing's coming to mind that of a coping mechanism and I'm probably not aware of it because I've got just so used to working in yeah. that way that I'll tell you something that I do do okay because I am if I can't I'm, I'm the worst at handwriting you can't read it and I, my, my spelling is atrocious right but I touch type 
And when I touch type on a keyboard, the spelling's perfect. It's not because I now know how to spell the word, I've got spell check. It's because I've memorized the patterns on the keyboard with the sound. So if I want to spell yeah. something really complicated, it's not the how you spell it, the letters in an order. It's the sound versus the pattern on the keyboard. So I'll be talking to someone on Teams I can now, but typing away what they're telling me. And then making, making I've, I'm just at the moment going through a team transition. So I'm going from one team to another team. And so I'm having project handover after project handover as I've got hundreds of lists. And as they're reeling it off, my brain is trying to work out what I want to say with the sounds and my, my hands are just doing the patterns on the keyboard. That's probably the only thing that I'm really conscious of um, because say my spelling on a keyboard is much faster, much more accurate than it is handwriting. It looks literally like my five-year-old word it. So that's the, that's the kind of difference. If you saw my handwriting of something and then something I'd written typed up, it would be completely different, you know? And the other thing I think as well, uh, just one of the strengths that we talk about, dyslexics tend to be really good at storytelling, okay? And I do work with a lot of people that are very technical. So they know the intricacies of concrete and the, everything that goes into it. But when they've got to write a report to tell someone who doesn't know anything about concrete, about that specific subject, it's really good technical, uh, technically, and, and it's got everything in it that it's meant to have in there. And you could write a PhD dissertation, but for someone trying to read it that doesn't know anything, it's completely lost. So I try and teach people in storytelling how we've got to we've got to paint the picture, we've got to tell the story. Every single drawing, every single report has got to tell tell a story on how we get from the start to the end. And and whilst I'm maybe not, I don't know every single intricacies of concrete or asphalt, particularly asphalt, um, for my field of engineering. Other people do, and I then construct that into a story that people who aren't technical can understand it and can read it, read it uh, in a way that they get the information that they need and in a visually pleasing way. So that's the bits I'm good at, but other people feed in all the great technical bits, you know. Exactly. It's exactly that. Because we already we we know what we want to say. We've planned out, outlined exactly what it looks like, what we're going to do. And then we'll go and populate it because we know that the story needs to be like this. Mm -hmm. you know, I say a lot of the mechanisms that dyslexic people put into place are actually mechanisms that everyone should put into place. Yeah. You know, with revision, you probably started or you do stuff like mind maps or whatever that we're, we're calling it these days, brainstorms. Or, I don't know if that's right, the right thing to say now, but anyway. Because, you know, you start here and then you, you go, all right, that's, that's, a, that's an area that we should talk about. And they lead on there. And then that's another area. And then rather than just words. One thing you said about word, you know, the fact that you type and stuff. One thing that, my, that a lot of software, well, definitely Microsoft have done, start doing now, is that they can, you can read and write. The software could read and write as well, to be honest with you. But you can... Um, what's, what's what the term is but you can speak and it will write down exactly what you're saying dictate yeah dictate that's the word I just found that on, on Word and I was telling my six colleagues about it and they're like this is brilliant it's amazing it's amazing brilliant. it's amazing um, but you also, also at the same time you can get people to, you can get uh, PDFs to read to you I mean it's mm -hmm. in robotic voice it's not the best but you can read to you so you, rather than you have to sit there and reading text yeah it'll read it with you and that's you know, the more different ways that we absorb information, the more it's going to, we're engaged with it. That's a big thing. Um, I, I, one of the things that, that, that I got um, taught was um, if you, if the, if you, when you're reading things get jumbled up, is to use a filter, like a, a yellow card or whatever color it is the best place for you. So yellow, I, I don't use it anymore because actually a lot of the paper that I use is now tinted yellow. <laughs> You know, yellow card helps. Yeah, you know, I have to say. yeah. Uh, and lists, I use just lists. As soon as I, I need to, because my short term memory is so bad, I will forget what I've just thought about. Mm -hmm. So I, on my phone or pad of papers, I've got an iPad. I try to use an iPad more now, so it's just centralized. I'll write down what I thought, write down, deleted it from my head. Now I think about Absolutely. it. Absolutely. 
Yeah, my phone is exactly the same as that. Hundreds of lists, things I've just thought about, write it down real quick. It's saved away. Yeah, same yeah. notepads and uh, OneNote on on Microsoft. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, it's just hundreds of notes. Same, <laughs> the same. OneNote, yeah. You know, and, and, and then if I want to take a, if I want to remind myself that I've got to come back to this section of a drawing, snip it, copy and paste, write a little bit about it. You know. Because. Uh, sorry. Go on, finish. I was going to say, uh, and I try to do things while I'm thinking about it. So if someone says, can you just send this email? I don't say, yeah, I'll send that in about 10 minutes. And I was like, when we send an email, what do we say? And I'll just start writing it there with them. Because <laughs> you know, I'm not, no point in hanging off to these things. It's just yeah. do things as, as you're thinking about it. Because we know our organisation is terrible. My organisation is terrible, naturally. Mm. Naturally, it's rubbish. So I've had to really build on my organisational skills so that I don't get tripped up by it. And it's really... But, you know, people should be organised regardless. <laughs> so the mechanisms that I put into place, lists, you know, um, like what you... you know, I think you guys use some in, in for, um oh, What do they call it? Um... Infranet, I don't know what it's called now. But anyway, some sort of system in... in yeah. Yeah, I don't know what it's called now. But anyway, a network else, very similar. But I also have my own, you know, folder structure in OneDrive. So mm. I know that if I have to find something, I know exactly where to go. Mm. You know, it's... OneNote is the same, you know, I've got... The way I've organised OneNote is, is that I've, I've tagged stuff. So I know exactly if I just search the tag, I will find it. Mm. Yeah, it's a ball it's setting up in the first place, but I know that it's going to save me so much time. Mm. So much time. Mm. Um, uh, yeah, it's stuff like that into, that we need to build, put into place so that mm. our defense doesn't catch us out mm. because we do, it's a strength just massively outshine the rest. Mm. And what we need in terms of mentors for, for that is just to have empathy and non judgment and just um, support in, in, you know searching for those coping mechanisms you know um because you know i've got a couple of mentors that I, I talk to on a regular basis and they'll say something i mean they don't know the answer but they'll say something um, you know you tried doing this or what about this they're just asking questions and thinking oh actually yeah if i try doing that that way i might be able to um to do it a bit quicker and easier or something like that you know that's where sort of leaders can get in and and help even if they don't quite understand they can coach ask questions mentor in terms of giving examples of, of maybe what's worked for them in the past um, and maybe you know I, i've thought about talking about talking to my organization about setting up a dyslexic forum within you know so in that you, you can then have more of these conversations like we're having now and share coping mechanisms across you know what what, what how what system do you do use to keep lists or you know things like that because uh, I think it would help there's a lot more people within your organization with dyslexia than you'll realize um, I just happen to be in a team where <laughs> the people I worked with on a daily basis all have dyslexia you know I don't know how it happened but it works um, so that's great well look I, we do unfortunately need to bring this podcast to a bit of a close um, usually I'd ask you know um, what you think is the most important aspect about leadership but this is a podcast about dyslexia so I really want to try and put out uh, something that might help somebody who is in the workplace with dyslexia and struggling a little bit or someone that's about to get into the workplace particularly into construction with dyslexia and um, what advice might you give to someone with dyslexia? I'd probably say don't be scared to ask for help. Don't be scared to look for help. Don't be scared to ask for help. Because with dyslexia, you know you won't be able to find what you've discussed about a dyslexia forum within within your organization. You it'll be very difficult for you to find a solution to your issues, your challenges. There's always someone else who's able to help, you know, be it a leader be it a fellow dyslexic person, be it the internet, you know, don't be scared to ask for help because you will only be able to thrive, my feelings is you'll only be able to thrive once you've, you know, really counteracted those negative symptoms, we'll call it, of dyslexia. 
Uh, and in doing so, you need to ask for help to do to do that. You know, dyslexia is not a taboo subject anymore. I know. Mm. I, I'm ha- I'd happily tell everybody. In fact, I do. That I'm dyslexic. Sorry, I'm dyslexic. I've not caught everything you just said there. You know, could you could you could you start again? Or and this is you know, tiredness for me is a huge huge plays a huge factor in me understanding things. Huge. You know, when I've had a decent sleep, six hours, whatever it'll be. You've got three kids, oh, fourth on the way, was it? You don't even know what sleep is, you know. I, I really don't. But tiredness for me, my dyslexia really comes apparent when I'm tired. Um, so, it's, so it's just about identifying that, you know, identifying where you need help, ask for help in those areas, and then, and then building upon that. But also do not forget, do not forget that dyslexia is a gift. It's a gift. It's a gift that many people do not have and not born with. So you need to utilize that gift to your best advantage. And that's a big, big thing for me. Big, big thing. You can't fake, like I said about the being the people person. You know when someone's been fake. You just know it. You just know. You know, empathy is not something that you can teach. You know, empathy is, is ingrained in people. And I think dyslexic people a lot of dyslexic people have that empathy because they want to understand people. They're a good people person, they're good communicators, et cetera, et cetera. So, so yeah, sorry, back to the original point you just said there. Yes, I don't be scared to ask for help. And asking for help sometimes requires all those things that you said earlier about um, having empathy, building up those connections and that support network around you. Um, you know, and, and I want to end on just something, a story I remember about Sir Richard Branston. Okay, and this is this is the guy who has Virgin Galactica, Virgin Orbit, Virgin Atlantic, and all these massive companies. Okay, and there was one story that I remember that he, for a very long time, had not a clue what the difference was between gross and net. He just wanted to know yeah, what yeah. was good. Which one? What's the good figure? What's the figure I need to know? And 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 his organ in his uh, his peers in that organisation said, like, "Do you not know the difference?" This is a person that's run multi-million pound businesses and he didn't understand the difference between gross and net. And he wasn't afraid to say, I don't understand. And then the, the great thing is, so say when you connect something to something, so someone, the description about the difference between gross and net, I hope I get this right, is that if you're a fisherman, gross is the fish in the sea. If you take your net and you catch fish, your net is what you've got in your net. That is the fish that's in your net. And then yeah. that's it. He knows what it is now. But if you try to explain that to someone with dyslexia with facts and figures, it's never going to stick. It's getting it to that visual side of things to stick. Um, but you're right. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Don't be afraid to own up to where your weaknesses are and, and build that network of people around you that are going to support you and not bring you down. And I think that's where... We're, uh, people with dyslexia are really good at and the most successful people with dyslexia really build on that and really use that to their advantage like Sir Richard Bronston. So, Lawrence it's been a really fantastic time to speak with you I do appreciate your time because I know you're a very busy man so and, and we've been planning this podcast for some time now so it's 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 Sorry. really great it's no it's brilliant it's really great to get this podcast episode in there um, so so thank you thank you again Good night.